I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. I'm not your therapist, but do you No, we can, you can be. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> now Gorange picks it up off the desk. Sensational goal. Yeah, so fucking good at the, <laughs> at the show because the numbers are proving it. How'd you know you had some comedy in you? Uh, in, in school early, the only reason this really started, my whole what I'm doing now, was the comedy was a form of coping and self-defense. I was a pick 10 in the AFL draft. Said club? Carlton. Oh my God, your, your dream club. Yes, dream. Probably more realistic view is that my heart was never in it. That's the reality of it. And that was the start of me going to the bottom of the barrel. Like as in mental health? As in mental health, as in everything. The day that I decided to check out was, and I haven't told the story about it, so it's obviously very open me saying it now. The day I decided to do it, I remember feeding my dogs. I then shut the door on them. I got my phone out and in my phone, I texted a message to my mum and my dad. And I said, I love you guys, but this is too hard. I'm not shy away from this stuff. No, because no, totally. I think it's important for people to talk about it. I, I get great joy out of knowing my purpose on this earth is to be here and to create content that makes people laugh. Daniel Gorringe, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me on. It's, you know, it's not very often I get AFL or former AFL players, but someone who actually um, uh, has a big AFL audience, which is you know, a, national, a national audience um, for your your show, your podcast, and your podcast, by the way, congratulations, very successful. Thank you. Yeah, we're, uh, yeah, things have been crazy at the moment. It's just, I don't want to say I've been lucky, but I've just built a cult following of AFL footy heads who love talking footy and being funny around it and, you know, creating jokes around stuff and a bit lighthearted. So everything's super different at what we do. So things are good, mate. It's exciting. I'm very happy to be here. So thanks for asking me to come on. Well, and uh, – I want to sort of dive into the AFL stuff. I mean, everyone knows that I'm an NRL guy, but it doesn't matter. I still follow Collingwood no, and say it very meekly. Um, oh, no. Yeah, There's I know. an issue already. Mate, I, I don't know. Everybody says that. Um, I don't know why. Why do you people hate Collingwood so much? I mean, you're a you're a Carlton fan. You just you guys, you know, you're just arrogant. You lot. Serious? Yeah. Last no. year, last year was a good year for you guys, and I get you celebrated. I haven't but, started so well this year. Well, your hangover's big. It's a yeah, big hangover. Totally. It must have been we a big did party. party it was a big party, so you can be forgiven. Um, yeah, I don't know. You guys just rub us the wrong way. I think when we see big clubs be successful, it just we don't pisses like that. You off. Yeah, it pisses off. We don't like that. Carlton's different. Carlton's well, you saw losers or what? Oh, massively. Well, but Carlton <laughs> is like an establishment joint. Like, uh, what was it? You, you guys had, um, I don't know, the the blokes from the um, Foster's Beer. Or the, you yeah. Some really rich dudes behind your club. Yeah. You know, in the past. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're like an establishment club. Yeah, pretty much. I feel like Carlton's different. Different? <laughs> My God. <laughs> Colin, Colin, the black and the white just gets it on the wrong way. It's just, I don't know. It's, it's you against the success. world. It's our success. Probably. Yeah, your success. And then Eddie back in the day, I'm a massive fan of Eddie, but used to come out and say some outlandish stuff and that would How get good. people the wrong way. I, I like it. But yeah, I just like the fire being there that everyone hates Collingwood. Well, that, well, that's important. Like, it's like here in Sydney. I'm on the board of Sydney Roosters. I've been on the board now for 21 years. And everyone hates us. Literally, everybody hates the Sydney Roosters. But we just keep aiming up and performing and winning grand finals yeah. and or getting in more grand finals than anybody else. And we are, of course, the original club, the only original club who's played every season since 1908. See, there you are. I don't even follow the NRL, but I hate the Roosters already. Already, exactly. <laughs> but then, and, and to be frank with you, we don't mind because mm. we, we, work, we, we work with that hate. You like your back against the wall. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We play better. Yeah. Um, and we that whole sort of um, mentality where we're in a – it's a bit of a siege mentality. Everyone else hates us. That makes us play better. Yeah. I think it keeps us together better as culturally as a team. Yeah. But let's talk about you, Dan. Yes. So, um, mate, you're a tall dude. I, I just had tall. George Kambosis in here. You saw on the way out. George is compared to you. I reckon he comes up to you about your waist. Yeah. How tall are you? Oh, I'm 6'7", six, 6'8". Six, so wow. yeah, I did saw I saw George bog past me. And I thought he could still just beat the living shit out of me. <laughs> <There is, laughs> no, he Yeah, he would kill me like, in three seconds. But actually, funnily enough, outside of the ring is is the nicest, quietest, meek, mild, well mannered bloke you'll mm -hmm. ever meet. Yeah, he's, he's just a lovely family man. The whole thing going on and. Uh, Flick when a switch. It, could you? Could, yeah, there's a switch. Mm. Um, could you just tell, take me through how you became 
an AFL player. So was it just because you're tall? I mean, how's that work in AFL world? I mean, a little bit. Uh, AFL, there's obviously the pathways where normally what would happen is your family would put you in an Auskick, the junior program, yep. when you're four, five, six, and then you go through the ranks from Auskick to your school footy, from your school footy to a state league side, a rep side to, you know, going to the championships, playing senior football, and the, that's the funnel normally to the AFL. I played soccer until I was 11, and all my mates, I, I switched schools. I bounced around schools growing up. And I went to this new school and all my mates that I'd made were playing AFL on the Saturdays. And I was like, well, they all come in on Monday and say how fun that game was and they have all the jokes. And I'm not inside those jokes. I'm out in the soccer field. So one random Monday, I, I turned to dad and said, I'm not playing soccer anymore. I want to go and play something that I have no right to play at 11 years old. Age? 11. 11, 11 which is a late, late start. You know, these guys have been playing for five, six, seven years. And that's how I got into it. I'd started and I was horrible at the start. Horrible. I remember my first game, not bending down to pick up the ball and just kicking it all on the ground like it was a soccer field still. But I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. And the journey started from there, from Adelaide and, and working my way up through these different teams and programs and got to what they call the top in the AFL. And it was a lot different when we got there. So were you so you were born and bred in Adelaide? Born and bred in Adelaide. I yeah. Gorange, what what Gorange, is that? Gorange is uh, English. English. My mum is Yugoslavian. My dad's from England. We grew up in Adelaide. As I said, I bounced around. Um, my mum and dad split when I was three, so I was between two homes. Um, I come from housing commissions, so we bounced around with the commissions because they would kick us out of our house and then we get rezoned to school. So that was obviously a not a difficult childhood, but it, it builds great character straight away as a kid to be like, okay, I have to piece together what's going on here. We're moving constantly and you have to make friends more often. So, um, That's interesting yeah. you have to piece things together. So do, do you consciously remember um, yeah. at, at some age, maybe six, seven, uh, thinking, well, it's a bit different to everyone else in my class and uh, I'm in a new area. I have to start to... Uh, you know, get all the jigsaw puzzle together so I work out where I fit in. Yeah. I remember, yeah. But early on, I think I remember just feeling like every four, every term, it almost felt like we were moving schools or we were moving house and never got comfortable. And maybe in some way, that's how I do business now, not ever being comfortable in the way I do things. I'm sure that has a connection to it. But what do you as, mean that? What do you mean by that? Not comfortable? I, I don't think I've ever been comfortable in my life. Ever. I was never comfortable in school making friends. I was never, I haven't been comfortable in my own business. I wasn't comfortable playing footy at all. I find most things in my life very uncomfortable. And when you say uncomfortable, do you mean um, you feel a bit disturbed or do you mean you just, you don't feel like you fit in or you're the odd bloke yeah, out? Yeah, a bit like that. Probably the odd one out. Uh, the odd one out definitely. Growing up as a young kid, definitely felt on the outside looking in. Growing up, football was my connection to fitting in because I was good at it. So that was the football key. Football in terms of AFL? AFL, yeah. Not, AFL. not soccer? No, yeah. not soccer. AFL was my key to fitting in. And then now that I'm doing the podcast and all this other stuff, I very much have an imposter syndrome. Like I don't, I don't see what everyone else sees. And it's great when, you know, um, you, you said – Congrats on everything I'm doing and an event last night, people said the same thing, but I don't see that at all, which is that feeling of not really feeling like I fit in. It, that's, that's really interesting. Um, and I just, if you don't mind, yeah. I'm not, I'm not your therapist, but do you, no, we, you can be, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but can we just explore that a little bit? Because uh, I've had sort of similar feelings, different sort of growing up background, but I had sort of similar feelings in some respects because, you know, People want to say to me, "Oh, wow!" and blah 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 about how well I'm doing, and uh, I don't really see it that way. I don't, I don't think about it like that. So, you have been very, you are very successful, um, particularly at the moment in relation to your podcast. But you don't really see it. No, not at all. What do you see? Honestly, not much in the mirror, which is kind of a little bit weird and sad and dark. I feel that. I just do stuff because I think it's good for me. I don't really see the waves and ripples that it has out there in the community or online. I'm just doing stuff because I think it's good. And I really, sometimes I, I wish I was able to sit back and be more proud of what I'm doing, but I just have this 
weird emotional response that I just am very much an imposter. Do, and, do you? Do, do, but Daniel, do you mean by that that um, when you say you you do what you think is good, as opposed to what everyone else is looking at, is that? Do you mean that you're more transactional? So in other words, you're not very strategic in relation to your business and your podcast and how it gets rolled out, but you're more like sitting in front of a guest and you're, you're just going for it. You're talking about shit and uh, Pretty much. saying whatever comes to your mind at the time, maybe playing on comedy a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, like someone I can think of is very similar to that that I can draw a parallel to is Matty Johns. Although Matty is much older than you and he's become quite strategic in relation to how he runs his business now. He's got his sons involved, et cetera. But I think in the beginning he was very transactional and he was just looking for the reactions. Yeah. And the reactions gave him a little bit more energy and it set him off into another path. Yeah. And then he'd just keep going down the path. Is that who you are? hundred percent. I mean, there has to be a little bit of strategic stuff behind the business and, you know, as you do when you plan your shows or you plan your content, there has to be that there, a, a, a little bit of a base. I'll be honest with you, I don't plan any fucking thing. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm serious, I don't. All the dudes around here do it for me. Yeah. Like, well, it's the, all planned for me, but I am transactional. Like, yeah. I come in and I'm seeing Daniel today. Mm. I read the brief before I get in yeah. and I think, oh, this is going to be interesting. Uh, I wouldn't mind sort of going down this, travelling yeah. down this territory, you know, uh, Sam Avery will give me a, like a two-minute brief, what he thinks is interesting. Um, mm. Some of those things I might run with, but really what I'm trying to do is I'm being transactional. I'm just trying to find stuff that interests me. I, yeah. mean, I, I, I love you, audience. I am l- trying to do what you want me to do, <laughs> but at the same time I'm trying to do what I want to do. I'm sort of a bit selfish about it. Mm. I am. And trying to find out. So so for me it's selfishness. Do you find a level of selfishness? I don't mean in a bad way, but a level no. of selfishness in it? Uh not well. What interests me type thing. Yeah. I think in my world, creating the content, I'm going to do what I think is funny and what I think will get hits. I don't really care what other people want or think is funny at all. I'm just doing stuff because I think it's funny. It's out there. Uh, that's very much the way that I'm I'm going up against the big traditional medias in football, especially your Channel 9s, your... SENs, 3RW, all these established companies who are so structured and they deliver the same mundane rollout. So in terms of what I'm doing, it's like, what do I, what would I want to listen to? What do I, what would I want to watch on a social media app? And that's what we're doing. There's no real strategy behind it. It's just whatever happens on a day-to-day basis, let's roll with it and put it out there. I suppose that is a strategy though. You're saying, how can I be different? What's unique about Daniel? Or mm. what can Daniel bring that is unique to the, to, a, to a, an audience? You won't get to the whole audience because maybe older dudes don't, don't want to listen to you. Maybe they think, oh, what the fuck is going on mm. here? This guy's yeah. off his head. Probably. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably right. They probably are right. I am off my head. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> No, but, and, and but there is also a strategy that you Im, that you implant comedy into it. Um, like I am not a funny person, so I could never do that. I try to bring out of you what's interesting to my audience. Mm. There's no way I can be fucking funny. I mean, like I, I mean, I, I mean, I like to laugh at what other people say, but I don't really have a funny bone in my body, <laughs> relatively speaking. How, how do you how do you harness your comedic part? I mean, where do you where did, how do you know you had some comedy in you? Uh, in, in school early. Yeah, I wasn't good on tests and on paper or anything like studying, but I could make people laugh. If you there was an audience. Oh, yeah. If there was a test of making people laugh in school, A pluses all the way through. Um, and I knew that was always there. In footy, and the only reason this really started, my whole what I'm doing now, was the comedy was a form of coping and self-defense to take the piss out of myself and say the stuff that I know you're all saying about me out there and I'll say it about me first, so you guys can't use it against me. For example, what do you, how do you mean? So I was a pick ten. I was a pick ten in the AFL draft. Number yep. one is your best pick. Yep. Eighteen year olds, best in the country, going to pool. Pick one's the best. Pick ten's the tenth best in the country. Not bad. Pretty good. I'll take that. Uh, pick normally your first top ten picks in the AFL draft. The clubs bank on you to be a 200, 300 game player. Win a flag. Win a couple of best and fairest. You're supposed to be a superstar. I played 26 games. I left two clubs. I was sacked from my first club and I retired before the second club could sack first me. First club? Gold Coast. Second club? Carlton. Oh my God, your, your dream club. Yes, dream. The The narrative around my career once I left was this guy is a spud. He was such a bust. He let so many people down. He never had any talent. So I thought, I know what you're saying about me. Let's let's bring it into light and I'll make, I'll take the piss out of it as well. 
And then once I did that, people actually enjoyed that side of, hey, this guy can have a laugh at himself. Like he doesn't take anything too seriously. He doesn't really care what we think of him. And it just snowballed from there. So, but initially I did that because I was so self-conscious about what they were saying about me that I just wanted to get to it first. If I get to it first, you guys can't use it against me as ammo. Well, that's a strategy in itself as well. So, so far we've discovered three strategies. Even though you Maybe I am pretty strategic, strategic now. Think about it. Yeah. Well, and, and sometimes when we're defensive, we're very good at being strategic. Mm. And so I want to just sort of move into that, def- why you would be defensive. Um, one, am I correct? Are you a bit defensive about who Daniel Gorringe is or who, or maybe who other people perceive you to be? I think definitely as a young kid, I reckon 18 to 25. Oh, no, younger if we're talking about my childhood. Childhood, so 10 to 25, super self-conscious. I cared about what everyone said. I went looking, trying to feed this narrative in my head, you know, online articles, what they're saying in forums. Let's go find it so I can confirm to myself that what they're saying about me is right. The good or bad we're talking about here? Bad. bad. I was like, let's, let's get all the bad stuff. I want to see it, what they're saying. And then I believed I was you, that person. You look for it. Yeah. Yeah, went out and looked for it. Is that a bit destructive? So destructive. So destructive. But back to this thing of being a top 10 pick, I was like, I'm not supposed to be this person, so let's see who they think I am. You know, I'm supposed to be the – I'm supposed to have played 200 games already and, and you know, done all these other things. I've played 20-odd. Let's see what they're saying and then create my own personality off that. Why did you only play 20? I Why mean, didn't you play 200? Probably a better way of putting it. Yeah. In fact, you, you stopped playing. But Yeah. I mean, me growing up – I was very much, I played in the ruck, so the big guy in the middle who taps the ball down at the start of the games. And my my ability in that position was to be very mobile, so quicker than the ruckman. I could jump higher than the other ruckman. That's why I probably went pick 10. Once I did my first Achilles, I lost all my ability to jump. I lost all my ability to sprint. Once I did my second Achilles, lost it more. By the time I did my fourth Achilles, I wasn't the same player at all. So that's there's that. But then there's also the very probably more realistic view is that my heart was never in it, never in it. My my goal was to get drafted. And once I got there, the foot came completely off the gas. I said, this isn't for me. I don't want to, I don't want to be here really. Why, 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 why? I mean, for some people it's a dream, but why is it you, once you got there, you didn't want to be there? Just was going, it- yeah. I mean, I went to the Gold Coast, so the structure wasn't there to be, I felt wasn't, enough around the footy club to promote development in young kids and not just football players, but people. And I just got to my point where I said, I don't want to compete for positions. I'm, I was very much used to being the best player on the best team. Give me the ball. I'll do the rest. Get the fuck out of my way. Got to the AFL and that just changed completely. No one's giving me that ball anymore. You want to the ball, you go get it. I did not have the heart to go get it. That's the reality of it. And, it was, and is it, I mean, Gold Coast is a, would be a tough place for a young guy, particularly from out of Adelaide, Blake. Uh, mm. Oh, yeah, bright it, lights. It's, it's When I say tough, it's not like going out to, um, I don't know what, it, what the equivalent is in Melbourne, but like it's not like going out to the west of Sydney where it's, you know, like you, they'll eat you alive. Yeah, um, it's, it's different. A bit different, different like Adelaide. This, but you can get eaten alive in the Gold Coast in that sure. you get sort of swamped by what goes on there. And sure. it's beautiful near the beaches, lifestyle. You yeah. know, fucking, you know, get up. It's a beautiful morning. Everything, everything's wonderful. Yeah, and meter maids. You get seduced. Yeah, you do into yeah. everything. You do. I walked down Cavill Avenue. I saw meter maids and said, "How good is this?" And you're six foot eight. Six like foot it's, eight. It's not as if you're going to. No, they're not going to notice you. Six foot eight. Yeah, the Gold Coast is just a different. You know, as, you, as you said, from Adelaide, then go to the Gold Coast, and it's just like, okay, I'm, I mean, I'm 18. I'm being paid good money now. Like I've money made it. I've never seen. I've made it. So I was like, I very much got comfortable no incentive no none at all none at all i knew and i had a three-year contract to start i then signed a two-year contract extension for the sons i got sacked after that and then got another two years so i was gifted these long contracts where it was easy to be comfortable and when they sack you they pay you out well when they sack you 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 have a contract for say my first one was till 2015 at the end of 2015 they made a decision on my contract not to extend it the next year so essentially your job's done like that in a month yeah, and yeah. then, but how, well, how, why did Colton pick you up? Well, once you get delisted, is what they call it, taken off a list, you go into a pool of all these other delisted people, and then other clubs can come and poach you and say, hey, we know what you did there for five years. We kind of like that you did this in three games. Let's see if we can get more of that out of you. And Carlton did that. They saw something in me and picked me up and said, come to come to Melbourne, and let's see if we can kind of rejuvenate your career. Being delisted, though, that's a bit like being abandoned uh, to me. Like, 
Mm. I mean, did that sort of set off so many, any alarm bells? Yeah. In Daniel's head? Yeah. Again, back to me trying to find, am I this person that people are saying about me? 100%. Yeah. This so, guy's a band. They don't want him. And then all the more articles came out. Top 10 pick gets taken off list. Um, yeah. It was probably, I think that was the start of me going to the bottom of the barrel. Like as in mental health? As in mental health, as in everything as a person. That was a start. And then going to Carlton for the two years after was, I found a little bit of my mojo back, but I was just, I was just hanging there by the end. So we, can we, just, I mean, it's, it's a big issue. Mm. Not often people want to talk about it. Or a lot of times people aren't brave enough to talk about it. But yeah. the mental health thing, what does that mean? Is it, we talk, what, to you, does, does that mean like, Maybe I'll ask you a question a bit more direct. Mm. Does that mean um, loss of confidence, um, loss of um, identity? Um, f- as I said earlier, feelings of abandonment. Yeah. Um, where the fuck do I fit in? Yeah, what? everything. That mean that like that loss of my personality, my identity was gone. The feeling of no one wanting me. I didn't for so long in my life. I'd had a scheduled day every day from being eighteen. You know what you're doing every day in a football club to them being 25 and not knowing what I'm doing at all. No direction, no support, no one to say, oh, here, um, come and kick a footy around and we'll give you $100,000 or $200,000. It was very much like, this is the real world now. Sort your shit out and you're by yourself. And my mental health got really bad to a point where I'd, I've said it before on, on other videos that we've done that I didn't want to be around here anymore. I was like, I'm out. I'm like, I can check out. Yeah, I could check out easily. I could say goodbye to everyone. And I'm done. That's how bad it got. But fortunately for me, things did turn around and now I'm in a spot where that feels like such a long time ago that there's, fingers crossed, no way I'd ever get back to that spot. bit dark, but I mean, mm. I'm on, unfortunately, you have to put up with me because I'm- Of course. Because I'm running the show. It's your pod. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, but I've often wondered about when someone feels as though they're, they're okay to check out mm. um, at a young age. Um what does that really mean? Like, um, I've never experienced it, but mm. do you actually say, man, you better fuck with they go or not? I mean, or, or, yeah. you, or, or, or is it you're so sad you just want to get away from the sadness? What, what is the feeling? Yeah. Can you explain to me? Yeah. Well, everyone's different. So for me, mine was I got to a point where every day just wasn't worth being up for. I was in bed, I was crying, I didn't have any mates because they all at footy and their lives were going so well and my life was so opposite to all of them. And the day that I, obviously it was bubbling away, but the day that I decided to check out was, and I haven't told the story about it, so it's obviously very open me saying it now. The day I decided to do it, I remember feeding my dogs. I then shut the door on them. I got my phone out and in my phone, I texted a message to my mum and my dad. And I said, I love you guys, but this is too hard. And I got in my car and put the pedal down to the ground, aiming for a tree. Wow. And something said in me as I got close to that tree, don't do that. Don't do that. And, and you I put you through the brake. And you, you sort of stopped the, the inevitable outcome. Yep. And thank God. Thank God. Can you, what, what was it? I mean, to, oh my God, to send something like that to your mother and father to say goodbye to your two dogs and put them in another room after you fed them. That's pretty heavy. Um, mm. What drove you forward though to actually get in the car and drive towards the tree? I mean, what I were you thinking? Done. I was just done, mate. I was at the lowest of lows. I had nothing. I didn't have a partner anymore. I didn't have any friends. I had no job. I had no money. I'd blown away a career that was supposed to be gone. I was like, there is nothing here for me at all, at all. I don't want to be here. This is just like, I'm just wasting everyone's time. And that's the thing about the mental health thing is that when you're that low in a spot, you don't think clearly, you know, people always say, reach out to someone because it's never as bad as it seems. And now after going to the, the other side of putting my foot on that brake and not going ahead, I can see that clearly now, but being in that spot, you don't think like that at all. You literally think like there is no way out at all. So you put your foot on the brake, you stopped. <laughs> what was your feeling when you, when you pulled up? Like how did you feel the moment your, your car pulled up and you did you feel relieved, happy, or what, what, what? I felt like you're such a piece of shit. You couldn't even do this. Then you say, "Come down on yourself. Give me some hard time." Yeah. 
If you can't thank even, you can't you even do, do that. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And now, thank fuck I didn't. Yeah. But I was like, at the time, I remember driving back home and being like, you can't even do that. Like, what can you do? What can you do? After that, the next couple of days were Did you, had still you sent dark. that to your parents? No, it was in my phone, ready to be drafted. Right. Ready to be drafted. So Senate got in the car, got ready, and then just hit the gas. But my plan was to send gas, go. Yeah. So I didn't send it. So, go. and then the, what did you do with the message? Deleted it. Deleted it. <laughs> yeah. Did you Backspace tell your mum everything? That? I probably haven't. I've told my mum. The only stuff that I've told mum and dad is that it got dark. I mean, they know now how dark it got. It's and and it, I don't I'm not shy away from this stuff no, because no, totally. I think it's important for people to talk about it and it's you know it's um something that as you said a lot of people do shy away from and each their own everyone feels comfortable with telling their own story so I'm more than open to, to say it and um and now thankfully I didn't do it I'm here which is great but I did <laughs> got the, got the message obviously backspace what I was going to say to them and the next few days after I said to my mum, I said, hey, I'm not good here. Like, I'm really, really bad. I need you to come over. And she came over from Adelaide. And from that point, we had a chat. I had to get some help with the psych. And that's when that was probably where things started to slowly turn and the momentum of being, feeling shit and having these bad days. And hey, I'm actually getting out of bed now. We can tick that off. That's pretty good. We got out of bed today. Oh, hey, you found a job. That's a big tick. You went to job five days in a row. That's a big... Slowly we started getting some small little wins. wins. Little wins. Little wins. Oh, your psych says, you know, you know, you're not the weirdo that you think you are, or you're not different because you feel like all these things in your head are just made up things. They're actually real things. Dick. And we changed. And and thank God. Life is so good right now. I love it. But back then, like even now, it's been a slog to get here. Is it, how important is it? Because a lot of people never, never really have this opportunity, but how important is it to have someone like your mum who came back over from Adelaide to see you? Um, and I imagine she probably came straight away. If, it was, mm. if that was me and my, with one of my kids, I definitely would have left whatever I was doing, would have gone straight away. Yeah. Um, how important is that? Huge. And it's Huge. And uh, what does your mum do? What was the first thing she does when she sees you? Give a hug, I guess. Well, it's even more big because it's my stepmom. Right, wow. So she has Serious? been the best Heavy. person in my life. My mum and I don't have a relationship. My stepmom has been a mother figure that has been – more than the mother I ever could ask for. She didn't choose to be my mum. No, sorry, she chose to be my mum. You know, she she and had you decision, chose her too, and I chose her. She's been amazing. But she came over. I didn't tell her the details of what had just happened. I didn't tell her what I'd done a few days before. I just said I'm not good, and I need you just to stay here for a couple of days. I need you to cook some meals for me. I need you to help me clean up. And while you do that, in my head, I'm going, okay, we have to turn some some wheels here and change things. But for her to do that is just. Amazing, amazing. I tell her now all the time, we send each other's messages about, I think she always knew something was up without saying it. It's not a normal chat to have with your mum about, hey, I'm fucking not feeling good. My mental health is bad. Not for anyone. Not for anyone. That's why people are still so secretive about it and they fight their own battles by themselves. But she's, yeah, she's probably the the one person that changed everything for me and I don't tell her that enough. It's, well, sounds, it sort of sounds pretty simple, but it's not that simple, but it sounds pretty simple. You know, she came over, helped you clean up, somebody had to talk to, she gave you a hug, um, she cooked you some meals. Mm. Um, but they're pretty basic, but pretty fundamental things like probably a little bit of comfort food, a little bit of yeah. nutrition, a bit of regularity. Yeah. Just having someone in the room that doesn't judge you. Just some TLC. All you need is just yeah. a cuddle. Have a mag. Yeah. Have just, a laugh. Yeah. Just you to- can rediscover yourself. Yeah. Uh, like – to anybody else out there who might be suffering at the moment from something similar to my, and you know if they're listening to this hope, hopefully that Daniel's got something for you but what is the first step to making that or reaching out so uh, you know like Daniel had to reach out to his stepmom mm. how did you do that like I mean, what's the first thought that when you might did you think oh if I do this it's embarrassing or if I do this um, I'm not really entitled to ask this question, but how did that all go through your head? Like, It's not comfortable. Um, I mean, easy with a parent because I think a parent will always know and always be there no matter what you need. Because there's a duty. Yeah, yeah, there is, 100%. And I th- the, the message was literally, I'm not good. I need you to come and be here. But what, what was it that gave you the authority or gave you the encouragement to se- send it, send that message? I just needed someone. 
I need someone, I looked at in my life and I'd said, who is in my life that would do that? Like, who do I know that would 100% rock up on my door in the next 24 hours if I sent that message? And she was the first person. That came to your mind? Yeah. yeah. Wow, and that's she amazing. Did. Yeah, and she made the effort. She got there and it's it's simple, but it's not. It's the simple thing is just ask someone just to be there. Naturally, as humans, we'll pick up on stuff when someone isn't right or something isn't going well for someone. You, We know that. We have instincts. We, we, can, we can tell that people sometimes aren't okay. And sometimes it's up to them in mental health to decide to tell you that, hey, this isn't good, I'm not good. Or they'll just appreciate you being there just for being there, How, like you said. Did you, did you over a period of time or at any time pretend that you're all good? And, uh, I mean, was that a thing? For you, my whole career. Really? Yeah, yeah, my whole career. Yeah, I so, knew I had mental health and early. Do you, and do you do that through comedy? By being a smart ass or a clown yeah. or the funny guy. Again, all the front, all the front to just yeah. cope with it and put up like a guard. You know, everything's all good. Let's laugh about this. Yeah. Um, I, I knew, I knew deep down when I went into the AFL that I'm not, because it wasn't really a thing. I mean, it was, but it wasn't. Mental health wasn't a thing that everyone, hey, boys, go to the pub and talk about mental health. That didn't happen. So I knew that I was one of now many people who come forward that we know. I knew early stages I had something going on upstairs. Yeah, massively. A lot of um, sportsmen in particular, but a lot of sportsmen, sports people um, suffer from this um, and they also suffer from this so-called imposter syndrome, um, whatever the right word for it, it doesn't really matter. Like I, I don't really deserve it type thing. And then they also um, are very good at comedy or taking the piss, mm. especially out of themselves. It's sort of like a, a, a suffrage. Like it's like um, I'll put shit on myself and everyone else will laugh at me. And that'll actually make me feel better. Yeah. Was that who Daniel Gorringe was? Yeah. yeah. Still is. Oh, yeah. Everything's fucking funny. Everything, if the, everything's funny. You know, who, who's the, who gets to tell you what's funny and what's not funny? Me, I find literally everything funny. I find dark stuff funny. I find light stuff funny. I find taking the piss out of myself funny. I find taking the piss out of you or whoever it might be funny. It's up to you if you think it's funny, you know? Like everything for me, I do, has helped me either cope with the shit that's going on in my life, lighten the room, Helped in business, that's my thing. You know, is that a technique you use? It? Do you, I mean, do you do you actively use that technique, comedy, to yeah. actually make other people feel feel happy or have a laugh or make yourself feel a little bit better about the situation or just sort of you know um, oil the path for you to do whatever it is you're trying to transact, whatever the case yeah. may be. Like it could be a podcast trying to transact with all your audience. Yeah, I'll grease the the ground by putting a whole lot of comedy out there. Yeah, it's my connection with people. Yeah. You know, whether I met you for the first time, whether I met you, you my best mate, whether you're my parents, family, that's my connection with people, having a laugh, having a good time. There's, I, I very much enjoy making people laugh. That's my thing. I, I get great joy out of knowing my purpose on this earth is to be here and to create content that makes people laugh and forgets about, they get to forget about their shitty day or a bad meeting with their boss or an argument with their friends for five, 10, 30 seconds. I love that I get to do that. Do you, do you do it as a character though? Like um, how does Daniel – I mean, I wouldn't have a clue how you create comedy. I, I don't fucking know. <laughs> but how do you do that? Like um, do, you, do you plan it or is it just on the spot? Or do you, spot. you examine people and you think oh, there's something funny there I could think it's funny for me so I'm going to say it? Yeah, just on the spot, yeah. And, it, and it back to – yeah, everything's literally on impulse. And if I've met you in the first, you know, for the first time and my icebreaker is comedy, I'm going to let something fly. And if you laugh, then we're away. If you don't, then, hey, maybe I'm going to say, nice to meet you and I'll bounce somewhere else because you and I probably won't get along that well or you and I are going to have a very awkward first encounter. But that's my that's my thing. Do you know what I reckon? I mean, I'm, I'm, I've never really thought about it too much. I'm sitting here thinking about it now as you're talking to me. And people who I think are funny, I think are funny, that I've thought of funny in my life, actually have – um, a look about them that makes me feel relaxed and comedic. Yeah. You, you got that look. There's <laughs> That's something good. <laughs> that but you do. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. something about you when you walked in the room into the studio here, um, and there's something about you the way you talk, and there's something about the way you look. Mm. Maybe the shapey face. I don't know what it is, but big nose. that looks. No, no, no it's, it's it's your big smile. I think. Oh, I'll take. No one's ever said that. I'll take that. You got a massive smile. Thank on you. you. It's normally a massive schnoz. And and oh, thank you. And your eyes light up. And uh, so there's something about the – there's an energy mm. coming out of you. Like yeah. it's, it's funny. Thank you. It's, and it's sort of um, probably not just funny. It's sort of refreshing. Great. It's, it's quite refreshing. Um, it's a bit very honest. Yeah. That's well, that's what I, what I want to be, you know. I don't want to – I want to 
when I when all this is said and done, when Daniel Goran is said and done, I want people to go, you know what? He was honest as all fuck. He was funny and he took the piss out of himself. I'm happy. My job's done there. You know, I don't care what you, th- if you hate me, you hate me. That's, that's fine. I, there's lots of people that hate other things. You know? So this is about what you want to be as opposed to, yeah. you know, it really doesn't matter what everyone thinks. I don't else, care. How else they describe you. And it's funny you, cause that's the sort of vibe I'm getting from you. A real honesty. And, uh, and, and with that comes something that I'm going to laugh at, or I'm going to find, I, I'm having, I haven't broken into a hilarious, uh, hilarious laughter, mm. but I find it amusing Great. You're, like, and yeah. I'm, I'm not trying to downplay it, but you're amusing, and I have, I'm, I'm just talking to you, like, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm getting an amusing sense from you. Like, I just prior to this podcast, I had George Cambosis in, like, and George is a, he's a good dude, but he's a serious, he's in a serious game, you know, he's yeah. fighting world's greatest fighters, and uh, and winning, and sometimes losing, but. You know, you get a, I get a deep from George. I get a sense of warrior and fucking killer. You know, like yeah, uh, it could punch you at any point, any time. <laughs> and with you though, I'm getting something totally different. I'm, I'm, uh, I, you're a big, long dude. Like uh, you're I a big, know, oh, there's limbs everywhere. Yeah, isn't there? Totally, like you're sort of like, like a big <laughs> giraffe. Like, yeah, totally yeah. daddy long legs yeah, just on the wall. <laughs> you keep touching your legs, like you're really I'm conscious. Not to do them. No, no, because they, I feel like they're going to hit my knee any second. Like because your legs are sticking out so much, the cameras probably can't see. But like his legs, there's legs everywhere, like, like this long. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's from hip to knee, right? <laughs> and then there's the rest of it. But uh, there's this sort of big, awkward sort of giraffe dude mm. sitting in front of me with a big smiley face and bright eyes and just telling me that um, he likes to make people laugh mm. and by taking the piss out of himself and by with a you know, with a great deal of honesty. And that's pretty fucking refreshing. Like, um, and how old are you now, by the way? I'm 31. 31. You still, you come across still as a really young 20s sort of guy, you know, like you, yeah, yeah, still, you're still fresh face, but your, your approach is that way. So is your podcast geared around what you consider to be, and if I'm accurate then, t- tell me if I'm not accurate, tell me if I'm not accurate, but if I was accurate then in that sort of character description and or assassination. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but well, if that's accurate, are you aware of that accuracy and that is just what you give your, you give your audience that accuracy? Yeah. Yeah. I give myself, I give them me. And this is me, you know, I mean, there's going to be times where I'm not like this shit goes on in my life and this doesn't happen, but I'm very much when the mics are on, when the camera's on, where there's people around, Let's give them the best version of me at this point right now. Like what is the best version of me to give people in this current moment? Let's give them that. And that's what you try and aim for. And with the, with the podcast, it's let's give these people that are listening who make me part of their lives, as your listeners do as well, they become part of, you become part of their lives, you're in their routine. Let's give them something. They've decided to tune into you. They've decided to watch your video. Let's give them something that they'll actually enjoy because they're taking time to invest in you. And the podcast, I think, 10 episodes in that we're doing, that we've done. Only 10 moment, episodes? Only 10. Wow. We reflected that. Yeah. So I had a podcast last year with um, a friend, but we've gone our different ways. Yep. And this new podcast is 10 episodes deep. Nine, nine, 10 today, 10. And and what sort of audience is you getting now? Just people that love their footy. I mean, we get, it. I mean, the main audience is probably 15 to 35, 40 year old males. And there has been such an infrastructure in place with the media in the AFL. I'm not sure if the NRL is the same, but it's been the same heads, the same voices yeah, same. for years, rolling out the same content. And I was like, I am so sick of this. I'm over this. There has to be something different because you guys aren't even talking or engaging with me anymore. You're just talking. So what can I create that actually people who listen to say, hey, I could have had that convo with with Dan in the pub. That's how that felt and that's how that sounded. And that's why we started this whole thing. I'm very much going after these mainstream medias to be like, this isn't happening anymore. You want like, to just disrupt, probably disrupt. I want to burn the, the absolute joint alive. I want to disrupt it. I want to be the bull in the china shop. I'm going to make sure that they know that Dan's doing some shit out here. So that's interesting because I had Willie Mason in here the other day. He's, he's a re- NRL guy. He's doing something very similar. And he's been criticised a lot for swearing. Mm-hmm. And But <laughs> Willie's... He's an out there guy. Um, he's also got a, a podcast similar to you, but it's a rugby league audience. And he cops a lot of cr- criticism from the incumbents, you know, the people have always been there forever. Mm. And because of Will, he's doing it his way. He's, he's a funny swear. guy, but he's really straight, yeah. forward, down, fucking says what he thinks, um, gets himself in a bit of trouble for saying what he thinks, but it doesn't matter. 
You sound, seem like to me you were doing the same thing. Willie's a few years old. You he might be in his mid forties. Mm. Um, your podcast. Tell me about the structure of it. So, when you say it's comedy and you're doing it differently, give me the structure. I mean, you must have a structure. You've done nine nine eps. So, how do you go through it? We do. So, uh, we do two episodes a week. Our Monday is normally the review from the round. Our Thursday is normally the preview coming up. Traditionally, what all other footy shows have done, it's been the same stuff of what what can we nitpick and what's negative? What has this player done? What's the biggest scandal we can pull out and drag this person through the mud? We don't do that. We are, this isn't. We're not doing that anymore. You know, we're going to be lighthearted. If someone fucks up a kick on the field, that's funny. As if someone does something scandalous off field, hey, let's look at it. Let's talk about it honestly. You know, is this person is doing drugs. Is he a drug dealer? Is he some kind of drug? Maybe he just had a big night. You know, yeah, yeah. that's what we're doing. We're not doing the traditional media type of just boring mundane and stuff. And judgments. Judgments. We don't judge. Who am I to play 26 games? Who am I to judge? Who am I to tell Scott Penderbury who's played 300 plus games? That was a horrible kick. He doesn't know who I am. Like, I don't want to do that. So our, our tone of voice is different. The, what we preview and what we review is totally different. We just make up stuff on the fly. So what is the tone the of fly. voice apart from being – Non-judgmental. Yeah, like this. We'll take the piss out of teams. If there's a bad team, let's take the piss out of them. You know, they're probably taking the piss out of themselves behind closed doors. If there's a good team, hey, the Collingwood, that's a good team. If Collingwood lose, though, uh-oh, man, it's a bit shaky now. If they've got a hangover, uh-oh, maybe you guys need a Gatorade and some Panadol. You know, lots, there's well, some stuff happening here. It's very interesting the way you just put that, Daniel. So how much of – how important is language to you? So um, you just said uh, – you called Hollywood, Collingwood's uh, not so great start to the season as a hangover from last year's success. Mm. Use the word hangover. You just use um, on a Gatorade or whatever mm. you use. How important is your language relative to the success of your show so far? Yeah, massively. The way the way that we speak and the words that we use and the phrases, creating our own phrases, creating names for things has been massive, huge, just to get into culture. The way that people are talking at the pubs or at footy clubs. We want, I want to be in the culture. I want to change the culture of the tone. I don't want to, no one at the pub has ever said, hey, Eddie Maguire or someone on Fox footy said that they're only going at 54% from the back pocket. When they go to the midfield, they go 23%. If they go to the pocket, they kick a goal. Who speaks like that? Like that's just analytics that I don't even know what you're talking about anymore. So the way we talk, the things we talk about, the tone we use is all, you know, all purposely driven to bring people in and make them feel like they're part of a language that only they understand. There's a, that's a pretty important strategy. I mean, how did you and or others form this strategy? Did you actually consciously sit down and do this or this is just something that you guys do anyway, you wrap this way? Yeah, I'm starting to think that I'm a lot more strategic than I initially well, said. Well, so far you've, you've yeah, given me about a whole lot, lot of strategies. Yeah, there's a lot of strategy behind it. Um, it's just something that I, I, I have found from creating videos five years ago to now has just worked your tone if you can create little slogans or little phrases or words or if you can put a light in this if you can put a team in a certain light and say something about them and it goes like wildfire people feel like they're part of something so it's been something that i've not really tried too hard i just i just put something down on a piece of paper or out in the world and it forms its own life i mean my listeners are so creative I can say one thing and then they'll take it a whole different direction and run with it. And then I jump on their bandwagon and go, oh, fuck, I don't even know what that means, but I'll use it. So yeah, it's that's the way it's going. But we're so young as well. Like this stuff, nine episodes in, we are nowhere near where I think we can be. So you welcome the um, interaction of your audience. Love it. And not only do you welcome it, but you run with it. Run with it, yeah. yeah. So you, uh, yeah. you take it up. So you, you, therefore, you must be spending a lot of time reading this stuff, or some your, your team, yeah. or whatever you got going on, is somehow you're you're either reading it and or um, you know playing it back and and giving them back uh, feedback as well. Yeah, yeah. We, we have a finger on the pulse and everything. There's so much that happens in the AFL world from games. We watch every game from videos that players are doing. They're doing something funny. I mean, some players got some wild boots last week, and we took the piss out of these boots. So we have. We're not the best at what we do at all, but there's no one else that does it like we do. So how so – because social media plays a big part in all this. Um, authentic – Daniel, the authentic Daniel, as opposed to Daniel, you know, the actor. Mm. Um, authenticity always wins by miles Yeah. in today's, oh, yeah. In today's age. I mean, and do you think that the incumbent media uh, – telling everybody the way they think everybody should be thinking and therefore they themselves are not being authentic and therefore you, you, it just leaves it wide open for you to take space. It's the, 
the commentators and the people presenting on radio, or whatever, their voices, are, they're being told what to say by someone else behind a back room, behind a wall, has just told them what to say. So it's not even their own, their voice. So ours is very much like, this is what I think. I'm going to stand by it. I'll cop the criticism, but I'll also get the praise if it goes and does its thing on social media or out in the world. So I, I looked at the traditional media and said, I will never be that. I will never be, you'll never see me in a suit and a tie in front of a TV presenting about these fence sitting thoughts. We will be out there. We'll say some things. We'll get it wrong. We'll cop some criticism, but we will say things that other people will not say. And I'm happy to do that. And, I mean, I, I don't want to bore everybody, but is is there a business model attached to this? Like, is it like about advertisers or subscriptions? How do you yeah. make a quid out of it? Sponsors come on board. I think the way that's happening right now, sponsors are, especially traditional media, is changed a lot. I think people, as you said, are looking for that authenticity. The numbers help, obviously, but we have we work with amazing brands. I work with Sportsbet, who are the best brand in the world. I work with Gatorade, who are also amazing. I think brands are ready to be a bit more looser with their their brands and say, hey, let's get behind something so that it becomes synonymous with with Dan or Dan does footy. And it's exciting. I think I think the whole space is going to change soon. I think you'll see very much less of the traditional media suit and ties and you'll see more of hopefully people like me going out and doing their own thing and plugging themselves into places where they can be found. And that being the name of the show, Dan Does Footy, mm. of your podcast – and by the way, very cleverly, you dropped the Gatorade word into our conversation about uh, ten minutes strategy. ago. <laughs> now that's tactical. Oh, tactical. What's wrong with you? You Sorry, play footy. Tactical. The yeah, coach true. works out the strategy. You <laughs> players do the tactics yeah, on the true, game. True, true. I should know that. You should know that better. <laughs> know. Anyway. That's why I was so bad. Didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just running around, mate. Yeah, but you're so fucking good at the at the show because the numbers are proving it. Mm. And in nine episodes in, you're killing it. Um, and th- and the fact is, you got um, you know a, a good sponsors, really basic advertisers, but good sponsors. Yeah. You have have to have because you've got to, you someone's got to get paid. You got to pay for cameras and producers and all that mm. stuff. People don't realize what goes on behind the scenes. No. There's a lot of shit going on, yeah. a lot of expenses. Um, where to from here? Do you see yourself as you know? You're going to be cele- celebrating a, your 500th yeah. episode. Do you see that? Hopefully, yeah. I, I see it. I think I, the, what I have in my head for next year is it will look very different to what it is right now. I see that we'll have a full built out panel of people who speak the same language to each other. And they're very much not versions of me, but their own people that come together like superheroes to make this great product. That's where I want to take it. And then I just want it to grow and grow, really. I just I just think I believe in it so much that the landscape is changing and that we're sick of hearing the same voices that I will build something that people want to tune actually want to tune into and not force to watch before a game. It's interesting. It doesn't sound like the same Daniel Gorringe who was um, looking at himself at the Gold Coast and thinking, I don't know if I can do this. Crazy, isn't it? Crazy. This is the only thing that I believe in myself, ever, ever believed in myself in. I And I mean, I did have to before when I was playing footy because it was competitive, but I didn't really. But this is the first time in my life where I believe in something so much that I want to build it. I want to be part of it. I want to be here as long as I can. And you want to compete. And I want to compete. I want to, as I said, I want to be the biggest in Australia and we are, that, that do it. I mean, there's so many people that do it now. There's so many amazing creators and people that put stuff into the world around the AFL, but I very much want to be the best and I believe I can do that. So do you sit back sometimes and you go, fuck, I mean, is this the same Daniel who has had his foot on the accelerators driving towards the, the, the tree mm. some years ago and now I'm here I'm sitting here, I'm in a top podcast in the country doing what I fucking love, competing because I love competing against everybody else. I've got a proper... I've got a proper um, objective and, um, and I've got a great narrative and it's doing what suits me. Do you ever sort of pinch yourself? See? That's where I'm still fucked up. Like I still just don't see it, you know, that imposter syndrome. I believe it, but I, when I look at it and I go, what? Like, no, it's, it's weird. It's a weird concept. Even I know it's weird. Like I say it to people, I say it to my psych, I say, look, everything's going so well, but I'm still very much like, you don't deserve to be here. You don't deserve to be doing this thing. But for some reason, I'm like, no, well, hold on. Some days I'm like, you can do this. Like, well, you I'd like to know what the psych says to you, what your therapist says to you, because I'd like to know, because I sometimes ask myself the same question. Mm. What do they say to you? Like when you say, this is going better than I ever thought, I don't really deserve to be here. Um, I always think something's going to go wrong. You know, like I always think, fuck, I'm going to lose everything. Or so, I, I, I remember many years ago, I, I don't know if you ever heard of Jerry Harvey from Harvey Norman, but Jerry's like a billionaire and 
super successful and all that sort of stuff. And um, I remember one time I was, he and I were hanging out and, and uh, it was like maybe 20 years ago, maybe more. No, it was 20 years ago because my, my son was 15. He was playing with, uh, we were playing with our kids together. And Jer- I said, Jerry, why you watch every dollar you spend like still? And he said, Mark, because I always feel as though sooner or later I'm going to lose all this and I don't really deserve it. And I have the same sort of feeling. Um, and I don't know if that's because of how I grew up or where I grew up in Sydney. I, I don't know the reason. But but it does actually make me be very sensible about the way I go about business and the way I spend money. I'm very careful. Um, that's what I call – that's my imposter syndrome. Yeah. Um, I feel as though someone's going to take it away from me and uh, and it's nearly a siege mentality. Um, but it works for me. Yeah. It, it drives me to make, I think, to make better decisions. How do you feel about your mentality? Do you actually want, want to change your imposter, so-called imposter syndrome or do you want to go with it because it works? I mean, I'd love to figure out why I'm like this because something, as I said in my psyche, something has happened growing up that has made me this way. I didn't – asked to really i'm sure you're the same didn't ask to feel like this i'd no. love to sit back and appreciate the success the money that everything i'd love that but i'm i'm just not like that so something's happened that we need to fi- i need to figure it out what happened when i was- do you need to figure it out though because well, I've, I've never figured i'm 68 i still haven't figured it out and I- maybe not maybe not it'd be nice to to know but maybe the part of not knowing is the reason why we're very much similar that someone will rip this away from me soon and that keeps me on edge to keep driving and going. Correct. It drives me. Yeah. That's why I keep same. working. Yeah. That's why I keep doing this. Yeah. Like I, I'll go and do a speech this afternoon for somebody and uh, people say, you don't need the money. But yeah, but I know, but it's not about the money for me. It's about just doing it. I'm not yeah. trying to stay relevant. And people say, oh, well, you're doing it because you want to stay relevant. Oh, yeah, fuck. I mean, like, I mean, I'd be, you know, I, mean, I just don't care. I mean, I, mm. I really don't care whether people think I'm good or not good. Love that. I, I mean, I don't want to be not good but because I, I want my product to be good. But I don't, I don't do it for those reasons. There's no ego involved in it for me. It's more that it I keep doing because it actually makes me keep doing things and I keep driving myself and I don't want to be like some of my friends who retired at 65 and they're just hanging around wondering what the fuck you're going to do. Like they got, they're bored off their tits and uh, they're physically unwell and uh, they don't look great and they, haven't, they, don't, they, they don't have a purpose anymore. Mm. For I me, that. I, that's important to me. And whether it's some mental health thing that's working for me, I actually don't want to fucking solve it. Great. Because um, it works. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you could easily do what your friends are doing, retire and yeah. just take it easy, like easily. But I love the fact that you're – um, my, my, my mindset's the same. Let's just keep doing shit. It's working. Someone might take this shit away from me and then we are done. And then what do we do then? But if I keep doing what I've been doing for so long, then this train might keep rolling. We might keep going here. you know, And evolving. And evolving and be better. And that's massive. I'd want to be better than I was yesterday, the week before, the year before. What? How can I get better every day? The what thing is that you're, the, the point that you are thinking about next year already, and it's only not even April, it's like we're in the first quarter of this year, is pretty important. Um, you're learning because you're sort of getting ahead of your audience, which is great. You're mm. thinking, how can I attract a bigger audience? How can I keep this current audience more engaged yep. or, or, or still engaged? Because your game is about getting new audience and retaining your old audience. That's that's sure, your real game. For sure. Because that's what advertisers, that's what your sponsors want. They want to know that you're talking to audience. If you've got one person listening to you, the sponsor might think you're really funny, good guy, blah, mm. blah, blah, blah. But, mate, they're not going to give you any duck. No. So if you're, as a business person – you got to think: How can I maintain, and how can I um, um, expand, and how can I influence yeah. my audience? Yeah. It, it doesn't mean you've got to tell them to buy a product, but I mean influence. I mean by engage them. Yeah, you have to. I mean, and my my goal isn't the business side of stuff at all. I have an amazing team who do that. But back to your point of bringing people in to listen, I can do that till the cows come home. That's that's my go. It's just the business model, mate. If I look at another spreadsheet, I couldn't tell you how the fuck to work that thing. I hate a spreadsheet. I'm allergic to them. My, my wife, my business people would give me spreadsheets. And I say, if you send me anything on a spreadsheet again, I might throw up. Stop sending me spreadsheets. Stop spending me dollar values and projections. Just tell me what I need to do in the most basic. Dumb it down like I'm five years old and tell me what you need from me and I'll tell you how to do it and then we'll come together. You know, it's what, you're, being a, you're quite a fascinating uh, interview for me. Um, so when you first came in here, and we're going to have to close it off, but I want to say this to you. When you first came in, you said, no, no strategy. Um, so, but you gave me about five strategies. <laughs> then we moved from strategy to tactics. Yeah. 
Um, and then you're also telling me that um, you don't care about sp- spreadsheets, but I'll bet you any money you know whether you're making more money than you are spending. And I'll and but now you're telling me as on top of that you're telling me how you're planning for next year, um, how to increase your audience, and you're only nine episodes in, and you're already number one. Uh, so I think Daniel Goring, you are doing something very fucking purposefully well, and uh, you're either you're either underplaying it to me, or you are one of those special blessed people who, despite their protestations about what how they consciously think of something unconsciously somewhere in your brain is all being planned and strategized and rolled out and improved and evolving and getting better and better and better otherwise you would not have the success that you currently have no well i feel like an idiot now i said i have no strategy and i've just gave you the whole business model so brilliant <laughs> i'm glad we got it now at least we got it now on camera but, and i can listen back to it that's not a bad strategy in itself <laughs> yeah. because right now You've just told the audience everything about you, and that that's goes right back down to authenticity. Yeah, yep. that goes right down to I don't really give a fuck whether you know my strategy or not. Mm. That's actually care. quite powerful. Yeah, when you tell people that I don't care. There's, if people are listening or competing with me, or people just want their own thing, fucking use it. Just but, use it. That's but good. You back yourself though. Yeah, you, not, you, I have to because you, you can't say, "Well, I won't tell anyone about what I'm doing because someone else might copy me." What you're saying is, "Well, if they fucking find it, so what?" I back myself. Yeah. How good does it feel? today that you actually sit around backing yourself compared to the dude who was at Gold Coast and down to Carlton. Unreal. I, and I'd, I'd love that. I'd, I'd back me against anyone. Give me the same mo- – in this realm, in this footy space that I'm in, i back me against anyone else. You can have the same model as me, but if it's you and me, I will tear you shreds. And I, I back I, – just and again, I believe in it so much. I believe in what I can do. I believe that there isn't another me. There's not another Dander's footy. There's, there's lots of things – and they might be better, they might be more polished and they might their videos might be cooler and their audio might sound better, but you're not gonna find another me. And I have to think like that. Otherwise this thing, back to why we don't, why we feel so awkward in imposter syndrome, keeps me on edge. Keeps me on edge to be like, you're the best today, but tomorrow, who knows, someone else might come up or well, okay, let's give them some more today. Let's give them a bit more gas. Oh, you were so good this month, but next month, who knows? Okay, we'll go harder again. Well, Daniel Gorange, um what you're doing, and I, and I probably can't, I definitely can't articulate it from this short conversation, but, mate, bottom line is give yourself a pat on the back. It's awesome. Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. 